Amen. God bless you. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. I'm so blessed and honored to be able to share with you all this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to just turn to the book of Joel, chapter 2 and verse 25. I want you to put your finger there, then I want you to go to Luke chapter 5. That's where I'll be taking most of what I'll be sharing with you this morning. Let me, while I'm doing some housekeeping, also appreciate the pastor, the senior pastor of this house, Pastor Arthur Shadwick and his wife. I want to thank you guys for the opportunity to share this morning. I don't take it for granted. Um, it's a privilege and an honor. Uh, about 18 months ago, Pastor and I met not very far from his house, and I told him I had a Jonah complex. You remember this conversation, Pastor? I told him that I could hear the voice of the Lord calling me, and what I would do is I would run in the opposite direction because I was afraid of the mantle that comes with leadership. I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you in your own life where you could hear the voice of the Lord calling and he's calling you to something great, but you're afraid. You're scared. You're not sure whether you have the stuff or not. And you get weak in the knees even, so you run. And I told him I'm not doing that anymore. That's how we started this process. If you have the place in your Bible, I'm going to ask you to just stand. I'm a little old school. <laughs> I want us to read the, the, the text together. Joel chapter 2 and verse 25. When you have it, say amen. amen. Let's read it all together. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Let's go to Luke and chapter 5. You have to, excuse me, I'm a little old school. I read from the King James Version, the these and the thous. But whatever version of the Bible you have, just read it along with me. Are you ready? And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. He and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, thrust out. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship, Verse 4, now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a draught. And Simon answering unto him said, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when, he, and when they had done, had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their nets began to break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were into the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with them at the drought of fishes, the amount of fish that they had taken. And so also was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto them, Fear not, henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook everything and followed him. I'm going to share with you a subject title, The Recovery Zone, this morning. The Recovery Zone. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of 
sharing the word. We thank you, Lord, that you by yourself will speak to your people. I submit myself to you. I ask God that you'd speak right through my vocal cords directly to the needs of your people. As the faces are different, so Lord are the needs. But I thank you that you are coming with a rhema right now word to touch the hearts of your people, to encourage them, to uplift them, and to send them launching into the deep. Father, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, for in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have your seats. One of my favorite things about the text that we just read is that so much of what we read in the Bible happens, really miraculous things happen at bodies of water. If you go into the Old Testament and you read the story of Moses, you know that the people of Israel leaving Egypt crossed over into the Promised Land. And how did they do that? First, by passing through the Red Sea. Jesus, at this same body of water, it's called the Lake of Gennesaret in Luke, but it's actually commonly referred to as the Sea of Galilee. And we know that at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus walked on water. The disciples saw him walking on water. They thought he was a ghost at first, and they were scared, but they knew that this happens at the body of water. And so whenever I see two things in a text, particularly in the old James, the King James, I start to pay attention. The first is the first five words in Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass. Every, almost every time you read that in the text, what the author is trying to do is tell you to start to pay attention because things are about to start moving fast. And it came to pass should also give you a lot of confidence that whatever situation that you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, it will come to pass. It's a fleeting moment. But if you hold on strong enough, if you have enough intestinal fortitude to deal with what you are seeing, it shall come to pass. That's particularly important in this text because the subject of this text is Simon Peter. And Simon has gone through some stuff. He has been through some stuff. And I want to kind of explain it to you and see if you can even relate to this in your everyday life. Simon was a fisher. He had spent his entire life fishing. And in those days, you didn't just fish because you were good at it. You did it because your daddy did it. And your grandfather did it. And your great-grandfather did it. And so this is, fishing is in his blood. This is what he does. In many ways, this is how he identifies who he is. If he goes out and fishes, and he fishes well, everybody knows that's Simon the fisher. But in this particular passage, Simon has failed at his mission. He went out overnight. He got the nets ready. He got his crew ready. They set sail for the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret. They go out. They do everything he's done, the stuff that's in his DNA, the things that he just takes for granted. He casts the nets out, and they catch nothing. Not only do they catch nothing, but they now have to take the long journey back to the shore, back and park the boat. Unfortunately for Simon, on this particular day, 
Jesus is passing through. And not only is Jesus passing through, but the text tells us he is being pressed by a multitude of people. Have you ever worked really hard to do something? Exercised all of your energy, all of your strength, and come up empty? I, I guess there's nobody who's ever had that happen. Let me, let me try on this side. Let me try on this side. Have you ever put your all into something that you identify as you. You work and you toil only to come up with zero. I guess there's some people on this side. Know. Let me come back on this side. Because some of you are really dressed nicely. I noticed everybody got their Sunday best on. But the truth of it is I know there's also somebody who has their Sunday best on this morning, but last night, when you were at home and nobody was watching and you rubbed the makeup off, sisters, you took the wig off, brothers, you didn't have your nice shoes and your nice socks and your jewelry and your game all set, you looked just like Simon did, washing your nets washing your nets. I'm, I'm going back on this side because I still don't think people understand where I'm trying to go. Washing your nets is not giving up. Washing your nets is a sign that you've tried and failed. You've tried and you failed. Some of you are doing it privately. Some of you are trying privately. You're failing but you're trying privately. Imagine if I told you you had to take your failures that you do in your closet when nobody sees you and bring them into the public space. What would that feel like? What would you think? Jesus is being pressed by a multitude of people and he notices there are two ships. Read the text. It says what he sees first is that there is no people inside the boat. It's after he notices that the fishermen are not in the boat that he sees them washing their nets. This is significant. Because some of you are trying and you are failing and you feel like nobody sees you. Some of you are in your private closet right now. You have been at this thing, at it and at it and at it and it just ain't working. I'm reminded of a story of um, a preacher who was driving his car and he was going down the road, and at some point, the car lets out on him. And he goes and opens the hood of the car, and as he's opening the hood of the car, this is not a mechanic, but he starts going through the battery and the coolant and the brake fluid, and the thing is steaming on him, and he's starting to get anxious. He doesn't know what's going on. He does what preachers do. He starts binding and casting and <laughs> telling all kinds of demons that don't exist that they need to get out of his vehicle. <laughs> he goes back into the car. He starts the engine, and he realizes that the car is just out of gas. <laughs> Should have filled up on the way. If only failure was that funny. If only trying and not succeeding was that hilarious. But I'm sure if you do some reflection this morning, what you will find is 
you'll be there just like Simon, washing your nets. The reason I call this message the recovery zone is because this is stage one. This is zone one. And in zone one, you are a fish out of water. If you've ever found yourself in this position before, you're a fish out of water. And I have some observations here that I want to share with you in stage one. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Simon has really suffered in a profound way, as I've said. And the evidence of his fa failure is that he's washing his nets. If you read this text and you see somebody washing their nets, and you hear preachers talk about this title, you often hear them equate washing their nets with giving up. That they had just stopped. And yeah, that's a little bit true. But in my opinion, there's just something deeper to this that you have to understand. And the first thing is that yeah, they were washing their nets, but why do fishermen wash their nets? Why do they do that? What's the practice? What's the procedure? If you understand why they do it, you'll have a much different perspective about what you see Simon doing. In those days when a fisherman casted out their net and they caught a lot of fish, they would also grab up a lot of dirt and shells and debris and all kinds of other stuff on the bottom on the seafloor. So washing their nets was really about purifying the tool that God had given them to do the very thing he called them to do. This is a purification process that is happening. But if you just glance over this, You'll miss it and you think these guys just gave up. What am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is you may have been down. You may have been out. But God is scrubbing you in this place. He's scrubbing you in this place. We have talked this year about how we want to recover all. That's why I chose the Joel chapter. We've talked about how this is a year of recovery for us. I don't know about you, but I spent so much time in 2020 thinking about things that I couldn't wait to have back in 2021. I couldn't wait to see my family again. I couldn't wait to see my friends again. I couldn't wait to go to the office again. I couldn't wait to get on a plane. I couldn't wait to take a trip. I couldn't wait to go to the beach. I couldn't wait to just not have to wear a mask anymore. I couldn't wait to get vaccinated. I couldn't wait to do this. I couldn't wait to do that. And God is faithful. So here I am and halfway through the year, I'm starting to recover all those things that I thought I missed in 2020. I don't know about you, but I would just take a praise break right now and thank God for all the things I thought that I missed out on on last year. And when I look back at the six months of this year, I know that I'm starting to recover them. I'm starting to pick them all back up again. And I, some of those things that I thought I wanted, I don't even need them anymore. I used to have a bad habit. We lived next to a mall. Yeah, you're all laughing because you guys got the bad habit too. It's not just me. Yeah. When that mall shut down in March of two, 2020, I'm going to tell you something. Things were not easy at my house. I can still smell the pizza at my favorite pizza place. My wife is smiling now because she knows exactly what I'm talking about. Tomato City. I just go in the mall and not even buy nothing. And just walk past it and just smell the aroma. Life is good. <laughs> Don't got no money, but here comes out the credit card because I got to have it. I know you know what I'm talking about. And when that mall shut down, that business shut down. No 
no more tomato city. And the truth is, I don't even miss it anymore. I also don't miss all the excess money and resources that God gave to me that I spent on things I didn't really need, but because it was right there and I had this habit that I hadn't broken yet. Are you with me? I wonder if there's some things that you had habits and things that you had that you were doing in 2020 that you thought were so important to you that you could not wait until the calendar closed only to turn around and get to 2020 and realize with some spiritual maturity, that's what I'm going to call it, I don't need that anymore because I've grown up, because I've moved on. And so when you're talking about recovery, what are you actually talking about then? Because if you've done this thing correctly, then you're not recovering stuff that you don't need from the last year. You're picking up the stuff that's going to help you to get to the next level. That's what Simon is doing when he washes his nets. See, to the multitude, it looks like these are fishermen who can't hack it anymore. It looks like these are guys that probably need a new profession. You mean to tell me that you have spent your whole life fishing and you didn't catch one fish? Not one fish? I can understand maybe if you go out there and you catch like five. You out there all night, this is the only thing you do. You grew up like this. Your daddy taught you how to do this. Your grandfather taught you to do like this. You know all the techniques. You know all the tricks. You do everything and you come up with nothing? And worse still, you have to stand in front of a group of people that you didn't even know were coming and show them the evidence of your failure. That's a different ball game. That's a different, that's a different, that's a different feeling, man. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I fall and I stumble, I don't want nobody around. Because I gotta get myself together. I gotta pick myself back up. I need some space. I don't want my wife around. I don't want my son around. I don't want friends around. Turn the social media off. Turn the phone off. Get away. I need some space. Simon doesn't have that luxury. But what he does have is something that you and I also have. That's Jesus. And that leads me to the other two observations that I want to make in this stage, which is the first, and the first one is, Jesus saw them in the midst of their failure, in the midst of their not being able to do everything that they thought that they were going to do. Jesus saw them. This is not insignificant either. Because if you've ever been to the Sea of Galilee, and I'm going I'm to do a little humble brag now. I was there <laughs> on the water in the place. And so the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, is surrounded by a whole bunch of mountains and valleys. It's a busy place, though. A lot of fisher activity, a lot of wharfs, a lot of beachfront property these days, King Herod's Hotel, it's a really massive hotel that's got a whole thing in the back, Pastor, you got to go. Um, and Jesus saw them, surrounded by a multitude of people that are screaming and probably hungry and maybe a little antsy because they've been following Jesus all over the place. They've heard about this guy that does amazing things, and all they want to do is hear from him. And Jesus saw them. 
when I read this in the text, I was reminded of the woman with the issue of blood. You remember the story, right? She's far away from Jesus, and there's just another crowd, probably a bigger crowd at this point in his ministry than there was the last time, or at least where we find him in Luke chapter 5. And she sees Jesus. She's been going through it. Twelve good years going through it. I thought last year was long. Imagine 12 of those back to back to back to back to back. Years sound like a long time. How many days is that? How many months is that? That's like a prison sentence. And every day, I'm sure she saw millions of people walk by. Couldn't nobody do nothing for her. Suffering, failing, publicly. And then all of a sudden, one day, Jesus comes walking by. And this time, he doesn't even see her. How could he? There were hundreds, thousands of people surrounding him. And she decided to do what I think I'm going to tell you to do if you find yourself in this stage, which is get back in the game. Get back in the boat. And she started. I, I imagine she first started crawling, because that's all she could really probably do. And as she started to take a couple steps, maybe she got up to her knees, and now she's doing this thing fighting through the crowd and pushing people and moving them around. And eventually she made it. Well, not really. You know the story. She reaches out with everything she had left and touches the hem of his garment. And what does Jesus say to the disciples? Who touched me? Disciples said, what do you mean? You see all these people? Everybody touched you. I touched you. No, 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 no. Who touched me? The significance of that moment is that she got back in the game. She got back in the game. Something happened on the inside of her that made her say, despite everything I've been through, despite everything I've seen, despite all the circumstances, despite despite all the obstacles, this, despite all the people who told me I can't and I won't and I will never and I will never be, I'm going to go. So if you're here today and you're really well dressed, but inside when you go back home, you're going to go in your prayer, prayer closet and start crying again about washing your nets, I'm here to tell you, you need to get back in the game. Get back in the game. Why should you get back in the game? Because the Lord sees you. He sees you. And it doesn't matter whether there's a multitude of people around. It doesn't matter whether you're by yourself. The Lord sees you. And that should give you some confidence. That should give Simon some confidence too. Because I don't think Simon knows who he is yet. See, in this moment, all Simon has ever thought of himself to be is an expert fisherman. He doesn't know that there's something on the inside of him that God is about to take out and use for his glory. But in this moment, at this time, because his identity is wrapped up in what he can see on the outside, He defines success in very simple terms. I either catch fish or I don't. I either get the promotion or I don't. I either buy the house or I don't. I either graduate or I don't. I either get the admission to the new program or I don't. 
the last observation that I want to make in this stage is that you serve a God of the process. And so success is never defined by the end result. It's always defined by the journey of how you get there. I tell my younger brothers and my wife all the time, we don't serve a God that believes in the principle of the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say when I say you don't serve a God that believes that the best thing for you is to go from point A to point B. Yeah, it happens every once in a while. You might strike oil, but for the most part, if God is trying to take you from point A to point B, you're going to visit X, <laughs> you're going to J, you're going to K, you going to I. How many people have been to I before? On the way to B, you went to D. If you're lucky, if you're really lucky, God is going to take you right to C. And from point C, you're going to be able to see B right there. But you ain't going to be able to touch it, though. Because it's not about whether you arrive at the destination. It's about what he's trying to teach you along the way. The good news is that by the time you actually arrive at point B, you got a story to tell. You have a story to tell. Let me tell you my story. I've known I wanted to be a lawyer for as long as I have been living. And when I started law school in 2009, I finally got to the place that I thought God had called me to be. Law school is a three-year process, so I'm now in the third year of law school. I'm a semester away from graduating. And a very unfortunate set of circumstances start to happen, one after the other after the other. Some out of my control, some in my control. Some I handled poorly, some there was really nothing I could do about. Gosh, this feels a lot like Simon. I'm a semester away from graduating with the Greek letters at the end. Latin letters, excuse me, cum laude, summa cum laude, magna cum laude. I grew up in an African house. That stuff means something, y'all. That means something. That means you're the best of the best. I remember when I was a kid, if I came home with a B plus on my report card, my mom was like, where's the A student at and why you think you ain't better than him? You better not come back here with no B pluses. You better come in here with some A's. Why you ain't in the front of the class? That's because she knew who I was supposed to be, even if I didn't know it myself. This is Simon's identity crisis that's happening right in front of us. Jesus wanted this Simon to be a disciple. That's what he called him to be, not a fisherman. That's beneath him. That's not what God wants to use him for his glory for. His calling is to be a disciple but he's fishing and not even doing it well. So stage two of this process starts in verse four. And I'll just read it to you. It's really short. And, it, and if you go and you, you just like breeze past it, you're going to miss the whole thing. But there's so much that's happening in this stage. Now, when he had done speaking, this is Jesus, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a draw. I'll go one verse ahead of that, verse 3. He, being Jesus, enters the ship, which is Simon's. Query, how does Jesus know which one of these boats is Simon's? 
the first time he saw them, there were no people on the boat. Did you guys notice that? When I read this text, I was curious. Now, I know that we serve a God that knows all things, can do all things, is all things. He's everywhere. But just humor me for a second. Jesus is surrounded by hundreds of people. He's on the high ground. He looks down at a multitude of ships. He notices only two boats that don't have fishermen in them. And when he gets down there, the guy who's having a problem, who's washing his nets, that's the boat that Jesus takes to get inside of. Maybe this is not a coincidence. Maybe this is a divine orchestration. I'll just put a pin in that. You can just chew on that for a second. Jesus says to him, thrust out. And that's what the piece of advice I want to give you if you find yourself in stage two of your process. This is the middle point. This is the part where you've gotten over all of the nicks and crannies that you've gotten from your failure and you're ready to like get back in the game. So you've taken my advice, you got up, you brushed yourself off, you're ready to go. Jesus says thrust out for a little bit. What is he doing here? I'm going to suggest to you that he's building confidence for Simon. Simon doesn't want to get back in that boat. I wouldn't. Why would he? He spent all night in that boat last night. Didn't get anything. And the first thing that Jesus says to them is, can you help me push this thing out a little bit? Jesus is about to give him a revelation. When you read the text, it says Jesus is talking to the multitude. He's teaching the multitude. Simon is a part of that multitude. Simon is about to get a revelation, a small, short window. And the reason I think that this is important is because some of you who have been washing your nets, Jesus is passing by and saying to you, thrust out a little bit. And my question for you this morning is, are you listening? Can you hear it? Can you see it? Can you feel it? Have you taken the opportunity to get past all of the failure, to get past everything that happens? It's not enough just to get back into the game. That's the easy part. The hard part is to be attentive to what the Spirit is saying to the church. Can you hear him? The Bible says, my sheep know me. They can hear my voice. I tell my younger brothers all the time, some of us, we are so simple-minded. We want God to open heaven and the skies to part and angels to come up and down the ladder like Jacob when we get to a decision point in our life. And then we want Jesus himself to descend from heaven when you get to that fork in the road moment and go that way. <laughs> God, I wish it worked that way. How many mistakes have I made in my life would I not have made if only I could hear the voice of God telling me what direction I'm supposed to go in? thrust out a little bit. I call this actually the trusting zone because it takes a little bit of trust in God to be able to do what he's asking to you do in this circumstance. You got to really trust God. 
to have experienced everything that Simon has experienced in this text and get back in the boat anyway. To shake off all the experiences, to shake off all the things that happen and still get back in the boat, you got to trust God. And I'm here to tell you this morning, some of you need to start trusting God just a little bit more. You need to close your eyes and forget all the things you see and all the things you hear and all the things that people tell you and all the th places that you can't go. And you need to just trust God. Tell the person that's sitting next to you, trust them. Trust them. Trust them when it's easy. Trust them when it's difficult. See, this is easy, right? Like, can you imagine being in this circumstance and the Son of God tells you to thrust out the boat? I mean, listen, I like to think of myself as somebody that has a little faith. This takes, like, none. Can we be, like, can we be honest? This takes none. This is the Son of God giving you direction. Literally, you can see him, and he's telling you, thrust out a little bit. Some of y'all can hear that same voice. Y'all can't see his face, and you're not trusting him. Some of you have had that same experience. The only difference is you didn't see him. And my question to you is, are you trusting? Are you trusting him in this stage of the process? Here's the other thing that Simon does in this space. He's actually very receptive to the instruction that he gets. Because sometimes when you have gone through something and you receive a word from God, it's very difficult to decipher whether or not that's actually God speaking to you or not. And whether that's actually what you're supposed to be doing. Think about it from the perspective of somebody who has never had and now you hear the voice of God telling you, this is what you must do to have. I would question whether or not this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I would wonder whether or not this is actually what God is saying. But he did it anyway. And here's my last point in this stage. Be careful, though, about small victories. Be careful about thinking that the end of your story is just simply getting back in the boat and thrusting out a little bit. Because if that were the case, this story ends in four verses, we're done, we're through, we can move on to the next stage. The reality is that God was trying to do more. Can I tell you a secret? You cannot recover a ton of stuff in shallow water. You can't recover everything that God had for you last year that you didn't get, and everything that God has coming for you this year with your ankles in the water. The water is not deep enough. There's not enough fish there. You can't do it. Let me tell you another secret. In order for you to actually recover something, you need to have actually lost something. And this is the place that we as Christians have the most trouble. Because we want the fast food drive through version of Christianity. We want the easiest possible, no obstacles, no restrictions type of relationship with God. But the scripture says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. We don't like that part. We always skip over that part, Pastor. We go right past that. We don't want it. We want to recover it all first. No, 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 no. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many. 
you got to go through a lot before you can recover something. When I talked to younger law students, I used to coach them. And they would always see me coming in wearing a nice suit, and I drove a pretty nice car, whatever. And they say, man, can I have all of those things? I say, yeah, you can. You can. I'll give it to you right now. You can have the keys. You can have the suit. You can have the briefcase. Here's what else you're going to take. You're going to take them sleepless nights that I had. You're going to take that time that I didn't get to spend with my family. You're going to take them student loans. I know you felt me on that one. Ridiculous, right? That somebody would want the benefit of your blessing without going through the process that you went through to get it. Can you imagine that you would just give them the spoils without the toils? My dad used to tell me, be careful of how much you wish for some other person's piece of heaven. Because you don't know the hell they went through to get it. There's somebody right now that's parked outside, has a really, really nice car, but they're sleeping in it. And there you are seeing all the benefits and all the good stuff and thinking, oh my God, if God could just do that for me. Not knowing the stuff that's going on in the background. Be careful of small victories. Be careful of seeing something that somebody else has. Be careful of seeing a blessing. God has blessed you individually. As the faces differ, so are the needs. So are the blessings. So are the gifts. You are not your brother. You are not your sister. You're not your friend. You're not your boss. You're not your coworker. God has put something on the inside of you specifically that's different than you. That's different than you. That's different than you. That's different than you. And ask yourself, what am I doing to get everything that God has on the inside of me? Forgetting about all the things that I see. And that's the challenge of stage three of this process. Launch out into the deep. Great, you got back in the game. I'm happy for you. Cool, you're trusting God now. Chop knuckle. But if you really want to recover this year, if you really want to get all the stuff, you need to launch out into the deep. This is faith at its apex. Imagine having gone through what Simon went through and then going back to the very same place using the very same tools with the very same people and trying to do the same thing that he just failed at again. Only on the instruction of the master. That's why the first thing he says is, Master, we was just here. Like, literally, we was just, we, ju we was just here, all of us in the same boat, and we worked all night, and we didn't get nothing. Revisiting his trauma all over again. 
going back to the very same place that he failed. But I love what he does in verse 5, in the second half of the verse. Nevertheless, at thy word, I'll let the nets down. Nevertheless, when you launch out into the deep, you better have some nevertheless inside of you. You better have some nevertheless. You better have some childlike faith, some childlike resilience. That's my word for the year, by the way, this year is resilience. I want to be just like my kid who, you know, you put him on the floor, he plays with the toys, he rocks back and forth at this stage, bumps his head, starts screaming. Ah! Two minutes later, you pat him on the back. It's like it never happened. I wonder if you are so resilient that you're willing to revisit the place of your failure. I wonder if you're so resilient that you're, really re you're willing to revisit the place that causes you the most pain on the master's instruction. This is a different type of faith, y'all. This is not that theoretical stuff that we read about in Hebrews. This is practical, real, tough stuff. Go back to where it hurts you the most because he told you to. And do the very same thing that you did that you know doesn't work. You just know, like, you know it doesn't work because you just lived it. You just experienced it. The wound is still bleeding. You haven't even healed over yet. And there he is telling you, go out into the deep and do it again. This is the recovery zone. This is the recovery zone. Because I believe that when Jesus said, go out into the deep, he wasn't talking about the same place that the boat was anchored. He wasn't talking about the place, the physical location. What he was talking about is the place of trusting God where you are willing to do just about anything <laughs> to recover it all. And that you're willing to do this without any evidence to suggest that this time it's going to be different than the last. This is the recovery zone. It's not easy to get here. It's not easy to be here. It takes something. But let me give you another little secret just between me and you and all the folks that are watching online. There's nothing in life that's worth having that doesn't cost you something. I'm a huge sports fanatic sometimes, and I learned that when you want to get season tickets to the Giants, you have to pay what's called the personal seat license. A personal seat license is a license that allows you the opportunity to eventually purchase a ticket. Let me say that again. You don't get the ticket with the license. You get the option to someday down the road be able to buy one. And the average season ticket holder spends 12 years purchasing purchase personal seat licenses without ever seeing a sniff of a ticket. It has to cost you something to get what you want. 
There ain't nothing in life that's worth having that ain't worth fighting for, though, is it? God is calling you to launch out into the deep because there's something that's worth having in the recovery zone. And can I give you another secret? It's not what you think it is. It's not what you think it is. Because, again, Simon's assignment is a fisher. So Simon goes out there and launches out into the deep and carries so many fish that he needs a gang of folks to come and help him. And even after all of them come and save them, they're still almost sinking by the time they get to the shore. Mission accomplished, right? When Jesus met him, he's a fisherman with no fish. He gets in the boat. He brushes it all off. Now he's got plenty of fish. All done. Nothing to see here. Story over. Except Jesus had more for him. So when he launched out into the deep, his perspective changed. Because how can you have an encounter with the master and go back the same way you came? How can you have seen Jesus and all of his might and all of his majesty and go back to doing the same old thing that you used to do before? God forbid. When you launch out into the deep, your perspective has got to change. You've got to be asking yourself, what am I actually launching out for? Is this just about the fish? Or is God trying to show me something else? I believe that Simon finally caught the revelation. Because as soon as he gets back, the first thing he does is fall on his knees and says, Master, forgive me for I have sinned. What was the sin that the fisherman who didn't catch any fish committed? He thought it was about the fish. He thought it was about the fish. It was never about the fish. It was about him. See, God had something else for him. God was going to do something else inside of him. God was going to do something else through him. He had a whole ministry through which all of us sitting in this room would be blessed. Because if he was not a disciple walking with Jesus and spreading the gospel and doing the work, there are, there are no Christians in Antioch. was more than just about fishing. It was more than nets and boats and harbors and there's something more. When you are praying tonight, today, for God to do recovery, you better ask him for something more. You better get past all of the superficial stuff that doesn't mean anything, the stuff that you think that people are going to see and help you and, and elevate you because of the stuff that they can see. You better ask him for the more. You better ask God to do more. When you launch out to the deep, you better ask God, God, what do you want me to do more spiritually? What do you want me to do more in my prayer life? How do you want me to dig more into the word? Draw me closer to you. That's what is actually happening in the deep, and it really has nothing to do with fish. It's not about your jewelry. It's not about your clothes. It's not about your house. When you're launching out into the deep, when you're going to go and recover all, you better recover 
everything that God has for you. And it's not the surface level stuff. It's in the deep. It's in the deep. Launch out into the deep. I'm about to close. And so Simon says in verse 8, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Why? Because he and all the people that were around him were surprised about all the fish. He did it, y'all. He did the same thing I just warned you not to do. He went out and launched out into the deep, had this incredible personal experience, and he went right back to what he knew. He said, Lord, look at all these fish. That's why I've sinned. I should have known that you were going to help me to do this. Watch what Jesus says in verse 10. Fear not. Henceforth, you're going to catch many men. Not fish, but men. Your assignment has changed. Your identity has changed. All because you got off the sidelines, got back into the game. Because you thrust it out and trusted God with the revelation that he gave you. And because you launched out into the deep. You're not the same person you used to be. The things that you were looking for, they don't matter anymore. Because what you want is more of him. What you want is more of the stuff that matters. This is the recovery zone. So recover everything. Don't just recover lost opportunity. Don't just recover the beach party. Don't recover the relationships with your friends that drag you into situations that you really don't need to be in. Launch out into the deep and recover everything that God is calling you to be. Come on and jump up on your feet. I want you to hold hands with the person that's standing next to you. Or fist bump, you know. If you're watching online, I want you to pray. And I want you to ask God that, Lord, in this year where you've called me to recover everything that I lost, help me to get back into the game. I worked all night. I fought and I clawed and I didn't get what I thought I needed. But here you are giving me a revelation. Lord, help me to trust you. And while I'm launching out into the deep, God, help me to make sure that those things that I'm seeking in this place are the things that are worth fighting for. I don't want the superficial recovery. Because now I understand you are not calling me about no fish. You've changed my assignment. Help me to recover the things that matter. 
Help me to recover that first love that I had when I first came into the body of Christ. Help me to ignite that fire that's on the inside of me. Some of you need some fresh oil this morning. Some of you, the candle is burning and the wick is almost done and you're at the end. But I'm here to tell you that you are about to receive a new strength. You're going to walk out of here on fire again. On fire for the things that matter because you had an experience in the deep, in the recovery zone. And so, Father, we thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We thank you, God, for every person that is under the sound of my voice, whether they're in the sanctuary or online. God, we know that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Lord, we thank you because you help us to prevail over all of them. And so for the one Lord who's in that prayer closet today who is not sure whether they're not gonna, they have what it takes, I pray, Father, that you would increase their courage, increase their strength, Lord, that they would get back into the game. Father, give them a revelation of where you're taking them to. Help them to be wary of small victories. And God, as they're launching out into the recovery zone, as they're launching out into the deep, God, I pray that you will go with them. That you would help them to see this encounter as the life-changing thing that you want it to be. And Father, that you would make sure that they recover everything that they lost everything that the caterpillar and the canker worm and the palmer worm took from them in 2020 and 2019 God I pray that they would recover it all recover it with a new perspective with a new zeal with a new lease on life that helps them to understand the true calling that you have for them in the kingdom We bless you. We glorify you. We thank you. If you're watching online or you're in the sanctuary and you've not made Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, you too are washing your nets, but you're doing it in a very different way because you've never been in the game. And you too, you need to recover. You need to recover from a life that doesn't glorify God and enter into the deep. So we want to pray with you this morning. And just say this prayer with me, Lord Jesus, I thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ to die for me on the cross. Your word says that if I confess my sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I know my righteousness is but a filthy rag before you, but I thank you for saving me. God, I ask you to be the Lord and Savior of my life from this day until my last day. In Jesus' name. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you are a member of the body of Christ. Come on and put your hands together for the new members of the body of Christ. we want you to do is to make sure that you get connected to our ministry. If you're watching online, just go ahead and let everybody know in the chat that you prayed that prayer. We're going to reach out to you. We're going to connect with you.
You can also connect with this ministry. You can email we care at the gathering NJ dot org. We care at the gathering church NJ dot org. We welcome you into the assembly of the kingdom and we know that heaven is rejoicing just because of one of you. Go, go, go this week and launch out in the deep knowing that when you do that, you're going to recover everything that God has for you. Praise God, church. Come up, you received that word this morning. Watch you just put your hands together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Minister Kevin, for sharing that word this morning. That was a rhema word from the Lord, and we receive it in Jesus' name. As we prepare to close this, this, um, this, this afternoon, and we want you to have a blessed week in the Lord. Don't forget in-person worship. Amen. Um, tomorrow, 530 a.m., we start to Thursday. Baptism Sunday, next Sunday. We look forward to seeing you here. Amen. And go and live a glorious week. Amen. In the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we bless you for this time as we go for one another, another from your presence, Lord. We ask that you will cover us, that you will keep us, that you will sustain us, Lord God. Oh God, we thank you, oh God, that as we walk in recovery zone, oh God, today and for this week, Father God, we will begin to walk in your promises, oh God, and seek out your perfect will for our lives like never before. So now unto the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. As we gather here today, go and scatter God's grace to your world. God bless you. Amen. We're going to exit through the regular way today. So for those who are in person, we're exiting through the rear today. Amen. God bless you. I rejoice today. I shall recover it all.